we prayed, we blessed the Lord, so let's talk. So tomorrow's Thanksgiving, in case you weren't aware. Anybody not know? Okay, tomorrow's Thanksgiving, and many of us aren't gonna have the same holiday that we've had in the past. We may see less people, some folks may be in or out of town, we may have different food, whatever that looks like, it may be different. Um, some of us feel like 2020 hasn't given us a lot to be thankful for. As a matter of fact, she's been pretty ugly. She's cracked quite a punch. We've had race, racial unrest, hurricanes that took us all the way to the Greek alphabet. I didn't realize that was a thing until this year. Um, COVID-19 goes without saying. We had lockdowns, mass, uh, changed hours in stores. Um, we had a lot of celebrity deaths this year that weren't even related to COVID. Like Kobe Bryant died this year. That's how long this year has been. I thought it was last year, but Kobe died this year. One of the greatest basketball players of all time. Chadwick Boseman, don't tell my grandson that the Black Panther is dead. So he is, don't tell anybody. Um, Alex Trebek, I don't know what you grew up watching, but I wanted to be smart. So I watched Jeopardy, had no idea what the answers were. But Alex Trebek died this year. Regis Philbin from Regis and Kathy Lee. If you're younger, you might not know who he is. Google him. Sean Connery, 007. What? Eddie Van Halen. I don't know what you listened to in the 80s, but I was an 80s rock band kind of girl, all right? So Van Halen and those folks. So we lost a lot. But tonight, let's look a little bit with about perspective. Perspective is a particular attitude towards or a way regarding of thinking regarding something. It's a point of view. Perspective is everything. So many things can get in the way of putting things in their proper perspective. And I would argue that the number one thing that gets in the way is emotion. Emotions create and distort perspective. In Jeremiah 17 and 9, the human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? Last week, my friend Pastor Dina was talking about how our emotions are faulty and can make it appear like something is love when it's really just an emotion. We can't rely on our very unstable emotions to lead and guide us, and we can't rely on them for our perspective. So, we've got points tonight. I don't generally do specific points, but tonight we have points. Point one, how do you see God? How do you see see God. So I've talked about this guy before. I think maybe I have some affinity towards Saul to Paul. Um, during the conversion of Saul on the road to Damascus, the Lord struck him blind to change his perspective. Saul's emotions had clouded his judgment. He was unable to see that Jesus was the Messiah. He made it his very life's mission to persecute all Christians. He was beating folks. He was killing folks, throwing folks in prison. He was pretty savage. And he honestly thought he was doing something right. He was doing things in the name of God. So God blinded him, the Lord blinded him to let him see the truth. Perspective is everything. Acts 9, 3 through 17. Let's read it. As he neared Damascus on his journey, he saw Suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, who you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul, of course, thought he was crazy. That's my emphasis added. They stood there speechless. <laughs> They heard the sound, but they did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days, he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. He went on a fast of sorts. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias, Yes, Lord. That's my God voice, in case you didn't know. <laughs> yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, 
go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered with lots of attitude, emphasis mine. I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, go with an exclamation point. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him what he must suffer in my name. Then Ananias went to see he was real obedient. He got on up then. Then and that's still me. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he, then he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul immediately saw, Saul immediately saw how God had changed him and how what he needed to do to fulfill his new mission. He was to lead people to Christ and to share the gospel for all generations to read. We're still reading about his story. Now, how do you see God? Do you see him as almighty? Do you see him as all-powerful? Sovereign? Or do you see him as someone who needs a little bit of help from you to help things turn out the way they need to? How do you see God? Number two, how do you see your situation? In 2 Kings, we're going to run into this guy who's another blind man scenario, so I'll bring you up to speed. Short version, Iana version. The king of Armon was fighting with Israel, but the prophet Elijah wanted to warn the king every single time. He said, hey, king of Israel, this is what they're going to do next. So the king of Armon was really mad because he could never win because they always had the strategy. They always knew what was going to happen. So king Armon got really mad. So what he did was he sent a whole lot of bunch of people to go get old dude. Short version. All right. You with me? All right. Second Kings 6, 15 through 18. That's where we catch up in the story. So, by the way, Elisha has a homeboy, also known as his servant. Any honest speak. 15. When the servant of, God, of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army of horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh, no, my Lord, what? Shall we do? The servant asked. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked to the hills and saw it full of horses and ch of chariots, uh, sorry, horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. As the enemy came down toward him, Elisha prayed to the Lord, strike this army with blindness. So he struck them with blindness, as Elisha had asked. Now, the prophet Elisha, Elisha did not see things through an earthly perspective. We hear a lot about heavenly perspective and earthly perspective here at Freedom Destiny. No matter what was going on around him, there was actually a literal army rolling up. Okay, they had rolled up, they surround the city. We got you surrounded, you got to go. Let's go. Posse up. Whoop, whoop. So that was going down. And he refused to see it that way. He looked right on past the situation. And even when his servant started tripping, freaked out, got afraid, all of those versions, the man of God asked God, Oh God, help him to see what I already know. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Now, people in our lives who are watching us as Christians, they're watching how we respond to the attacks of the enemy around us. 
our perspective in the craziness can bring chaos or peace. How do you see your situation? So, point three, how do you see other people? Audience participation. If you are online, participate as well. If you're online, there's a little chat box. Respond as necessary. All right, moving out of the way so Lou can get that on the screen. Or, or not Lou, apologies. All right, so an optical illusion is something that deceives the eye by appearing to be other than it is. An experience of seeing something that may or may not exist. So. Miguel is going to put the first one up. If I'm in your way, I'm sorry. All right, so here's our picture. We're in audience participation. Who sees the vase first? Who saw the vase first? Raise your hand. All right, if you saw the vase first. Who saw the faces first? Oh, but do both exist here? Uh, participation? Someone says yes, someone says no. So here in the middle, there's a vase. And here's one face. Here's another face. What? All right, next one. All right, look at that. Who saw old, two old people about to kiss first? Who saw two guitarists first? Who sees neither of them? I mean, that's, I mean, just being honest. So old lady here, old man here, guitar, what? What do you say? You don't see it? Okay, here's a face here. Oh, you see, and Miss Pastor Dina sees a third thing. So here you see a face of a, first, a person, a woman. This is her earring, a face of a man. That's his little eyebrow. But you also see a person sitting down holding his hat or her hat, a person sitting down with a guitar. Pastor Dina points out another thing. She sees a vase in the middle. I ain't gonna lie, I never saw the vase. I've been looking at these pictures for a long time. Pastor Dina had a different perspective. All right, next one. All right, look at that one. Who saw a man with his hand on his chest first? That's the one I saw first, not gonna lie. Who sees a man and a woman and a dog? All right, so here's the man's head. This is like his shoulders, and this is like his hand on his chest. See it? Okay. This is a man here with a cane. This is a lady who looks to be nursing a baby. And this is a dog. Where? Show me where. Right, right corner. Oh! I'm sorry, I got excited. Oh, and then there's like a baby face. Oh, and then there's like another face. Ooh, that's kind of crazy. So yeah, okay, so there's this little face, to me looks like a baby. Then you got this little face, looks like somebody kissing somebody by himself. Then you have this face, looks like the hair grows into this. Anything else y'all see? You might have to get all the close up on this one. Like you might have to come up and look at this in your spare time. Isn't that crazy? That's crazy. I didn't even see some of those. I like playing with y'all. <laughs> All right, I'm going to read you a story. Hold. This time I remember to take the top off. Look at God. Won't he do it? All right. Now, I read <laughs> sixth grade. Picture it. I don't know what year that was. I had a teacher. This is when all my sixth grade classes were taught by one person. Her name was Mrs. Phillips. She was a robust black woman who had two pair of glasses. One was always lost and the other one was in her hair. And she could never find any of her glasses. And she sat at a table. She taught everything from a little round table in the, in the middle of the room. And Miss Phillips taught us poetry. And every Friday, you had to be ready to recite your poem. I do not recall if I could say this one from memory, so I will be reading it to you today. But I do remember some all the way from sixth grade, which I would have been, what, 12? Okay, good. Thank you, Gabe. Maybe, maybe 11. Okay. All right. The Blind Man and the Elephant. Blind Men, actually. By John Godfrey Sachs. It was six men of Indostan to learning much inclined, 
who went to see the elephant, though all of them were blind, that each by observation might satisfy his mind. The first approached the elephant and happening to fall against the broad and sturdy side at once began to bawl. God bless me, but this elephant is nothing but a wall. The second, feeling the tusk, cried, Ho, what have we here? So very round and smooth and sharp, to me tis mighty clear. This wonder of an elephant is very like a spear. The third approached the animal, and happening to take the squirming trunk within his hands, I see, quoth he, the elephant is very like a snake. The fourth reached out his eager hand and felt about the knee. What most wondrous beast is like is plain to see, quoth he. Tis clear enough the elephant is very like a tree. The fifth, whose chance to touch the ear, said even the blindest man can tell what this resembles most. Deny the fact who can, this marvel of an elephant is very like a fan. The sixth no sooner had begun about the beast to grope than seizing on the swinging tail that fell within his scope. I see, quoth he, the elephant is very like a rope. And so these men of Indistan disputed loud and long, each in his own opinion, exceeding stiff and strong, though each was partly right and all were in the wrong. So off theologic wars, the disputes, I ween, tread on the utterance, other ignorance of what each other mean, and prate about the elephant no one of them has seen. The crazy part about the optical illusions and the blind men and the elephant is that everyone was kind of right, right? Because even heard somebody over there say, nope, that's not what it is. I'm like, yeah, actually it is. I never saw the faces, but you saw the faces. I saw the people playing the instruments before I saw the faces. Everybody saw something different. How do you really know if one is the right one? How do you know which version is right? Or is it just what you see? Are you in the right perspective or am I wrong? Are you right? Are you wrong? When I pointed out the other version of the pictures or someone else pointed them out, Many of us didn't see the other picture because we saw the first one first. Each of the blind men only understood the part of the elephant that they were touching, but they couldn't see the whole picture. Sometimes perspective can even damage relationships if we allow it. The blind men started arguing because they were so right. Nope, it's a fan. Nope, it's a tree. You crazy, it's a rope. And they just stayed there. How many of us stay there? Mad. Point four, how do people see you? During 2020, many of us have neglected to have hard conversations because people have chosen not to listen to each other. In all of our rightness and our self-righteousness, we forgot about relationship with each other. Just because you and I don't agree doesn't mean that you shouldn't listen to me and I shouldn't listen to you. Often our ears will hear what a person is saying, but that doesn't mean we're truly listening. Sometimes we're so busy thinking of our know-it-all answer that we don't even hear anybody. We're like waiting for them to take a breath. <gasps> okay, you're done? Well, let me tell you. Hadn't even taken it in. Like, you don't even pause, take a breath, process. My husband's a processor, and it's really hard for me sometimes. I'm like, say something, because I'm always ready. Pray for me. In women's ministry over the past year, we've been doing the Entreat Me Not Women, Entreat Me Not Women's Breakfasts, uh, shameless plug, Saturday, December 5th, 8.30 to 10 o'clock. Please be there, be square, bring a dish. If you can't cook, again, go to Publix. All right. <laughs> We've been having conversations in an effort to bridge the gap between generations of women. The crazy part is that the commonality between all of the generations was the same. They want to be heard. Perspective is everything. What I've tried to teach many of my friends lately is this. 
common sense is not common. Talk about it. Mm, amen. Amen. Mm, Jesus. Just because you think someone should know something or how to do something doesn't mean they do. Just because I own a TV doesn't mean I can take it apart. Sometimes I can't even operate the remote. Just because I have a stove doesn't, and I know how to eat doesn't mean I can cook. Amen. Miss Sandra, I'm not cooking no turkey. She asked me, well, have you started cooking your turkey? No, I'm not cooking turkey, Miss Sandra. You ever seen me cook something? Nope. I cook about five things really well. Tuna is one. Hello. <laughs> With no eggs because I have to boil something. Oh, sorry. Back to the point. <laughs> now, just because I've seen a car and I've watched other people drive cars doesn't mean I myself know how to drive, right? Here's the thing. Don't make people feel ignorant because they don't know something. Teach them. As an educator, I've tried to make myself a lifelong learner. I like to read, I like to listen to audiobooks, and I really like to ask people about their experiences to learn more about them and to learn more about stuff, like everything. There's so much that I don't know and I don't mind saying, I don't know. But what do I do? Google, y'all know, Google has become my friend and many times there are things that people will consider to be simple or common that I don't know. My Google many times has become my source of stuff I don't know or I wonder why, when did that, how was that? It's my favorite. Now, here's a quietly kept secret that I'm gonna let everybody in on. Are you ready? Sometimes people feel ashamed about asking questions others feel like they should know. If we don't teach people how to access information and from where, they may turn to sources that do not have their best interests at heart. Especially our young people. Perspective is everything. In Romans 10, Paul is instructing the church in Romans about sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with everyone. He says in Romans 10, 14, how then can they call on the one who they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they've not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? Before you get all freaked out about the word preaching, you're not excluded from sharing the truth and wisdom just because you don't stand in the pulpit. Andrew Wilson wrote about the difference between preaching and teaching. Preaching is proclaiming, heralding, and announcing news to the people, the gospel, especially but not exclusively to those who haven't heard it before. Teaching is explaining things about the gospel that people don't understand and instructing them on how to live in the light of it. So, therefore, we're all commissioned by Christ to be preachers and teachers of the gospel. One of the most quoted people in this church is Pastor Dina Duchesne. I think you would agree. And in this moment, relevant, Pastor Dina always says that you have to put the hay down where the horses can get it. Because it's real cute if we're just talking lofty and you have no clue what I just said. But if I make it life application and put the hay down where the horses can get it, because horses are not giraffes, in case anybody wanted to know, they can only get so high and horses actually eat down. So you gotta put the hay down where the horses can get it. Now, out of all the perspectives that we've talked about, how do you see God? How do you see your situation? How do you see other people? How do people see you? There's one very important perspective. How does God see you? How does God see you? Because people's opinions, eh, 
don't really matter. You have to kind of, as the old folks say, let that run off like water off a duck's back. Sometimes you got to slide and be like, that ain't mine. Sometimes you just have to keep your mouth shut and go, heard. <laughs> Not talking to you anymore. <laughs> or just, mm-hmm, mm, thank you so much. There are people who are going to speak to you about you and you need to check yourself before you wreck yourself. You've got to do that. But guess what you do? Lord, please speak to me. If what the lady doth say is true, please, Father, please speak to me, Holy One. You may not use the accent at your home, but in my home I do. Father, speak, Holy One. God of everything. God of Isaac, Abraham, Jacob, baby Jesus in a manger, all of that. Whatever you need to do to communicate, God, help me to see. Is, what, is there some validity to what that person said? Do I need to, before I get all mad at them, hold on a second. Maybe there's something to it. But most of us, if we're honest, hate getting that close to the mirror. I have to get close to the mirror when I put my makeup on because I can't see. But generally, let me tell you what I'm looking at. That one part. Right? I'm only looking at this, my mascara right here. That's all I'm looking at right there. I don't actually look and look at the whole thing and go, what is that on your cheek? What is, your eyebrows look funny. Like to look at the whole picture and to ask God, put the mirror right here, God, the magnifying mirror. If you don't know what a magnifying mirror is, it's the one, you look at the regular one, then you turn the mirror this way and it's like, oh, it's so close. <laughs> That's the one you need to look at, okay? That's the one. So the amazing thing about God in Psalm 139, 13 through 18, he says, or they say what he say about them. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. Wait a second. He love you like that? Like, you're that amazing to him? Okay. God's love is unstoppable, it's unchanging, it's unconditional, and it's unending. There's nothing you can do to separate yourself from the love of God. Lauren Daigle has a song that I love that I think has crossed over, as they call it says you say it's called you say and there are a few lyrics that struck me about the difference between our perspective and God's she says you say I am loved when I can't feel a thing you say I'm strong when I think I'm weak you say I'm held when I'm falling short and when I don't belong you say I'm yours the only thing that matters now is everything you think of me in you, I find my worth. In you, I find my identity. We have to look through the lens of the Father to see us through his perspective. Perspective is everything. If the band wants to go ahead and come up, no matter how things have looked this year or how they'll look next year or every day from here on out, we actually have choices to make. God gave us free will, not just in the moment that we choose him and salvation, but free will to choose in every area of our lives every day. We can choose love or we can choose hate. We can choose peace or we can choose chaos. We can choose to be positive Penny or negative Nancy. We get to choose. Now, I admit that I have been over 2020 and I just wanted it to end and be done. However, I can actually choose to remember what this year has done. 
this year has forced us to reevaluate everything. Everything we've ever known. How we spend our time, how and when we spend our money. Amazon made a whole lot of money off of us this year. Where we work, when we work, and if we work. It has caused us to reevaluate the people in our lives and the places they hold in our lives. It's caused us to think about church, our faith, and our fears differently. Hopefully, this year has caused us to refocus, to change our perspective. We have to make a mind shift. Philippians 2, 5 says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Perspective is everything. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 18, give thanks in all circumstances for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. We get to choose today. Will we focus on our circumstances, what's going on around us, or will we focus on giving thanks no matter what? Because His will is perfect. If we truly believe He's in control, if we truly believe He's sovereign, if we believe that all things work together for the good, shouldn't we just go ahead and start giving thanks? But it's a choice. Tonight, some of us will need to come to the altar and repent to God for not trusting Him this year and not appreciating the time that He gave us as a gift. Some of us need to refocus and get our minds right about the free will choices that we've made and the ones we need to make. Some of us will need to refocus how we see ourselves, how people see us, how we see God, how we see others. Now, if you don't know God, this God that we talk about, if you don't know Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God, let me introduce you to Him. Jesus is the Son of God. God gave up His only Son just for you and me to save us from death, hell, and the grave. And the Bible says in Romans that you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and you shall be saved. Saved means you're saved from hell. And He died one time for all of us. He died one time for every sin. He died one time. So tonight, if you need to know Jesus, if you want prayer of agreement, or if you need to come to this altar and repent, as Pastor Matt said, as the band sang together, come to this altar tonight. Worship the King of glory with the band this last song. Amen.